Hi everyone, welcome to today's live broadcast, a CURE Educated Patient Webinar in Metastatic Colorectal Cancer. I'm Christy Call, Editorial Director of CURE. We are pleased to bring you this webcast presented by CURE and in partnership with Bayer. We have a few important announcements before we begin. We encourage you to ask questions during the event, which you can submit by typing them into the Q&A box. You will be receiving a survey via email tomorrow. As a thank you for watching the full webinar and completing the survey, you'll also be entered to win one of three Visa gift cards. We are pleased to be joined today by our moderator, Kelly Roan, Advanced Practice Nurse, Gastrointestinal Oncology Division of Hematology Oncology at Mayo Clinic, Nina Grennan, Adult Geriatric Nurse Practitioner at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, and Amber Norton, Physician Nurse with a focus on GI and GU cancers at West Cancer Center and Research Institute. Thank you for joining us today, and we'll, I'll now pass it off to our moderator to begin the discussion. Welcome, everyone. We're going to um, begin our discussion, and our first um, topic is the efficacy of managing adverse events and side effects from treatments with from colorectal cancer. Um, Nina, can you describe to us some of the more common side effects that you see from your colorectal cancer patients who are being treated with chemotherapy? Sure. Um, thank you, Kelly, and good evening, everyone. Um, so the, most of the uh, co common uh, side effects uh, from the treatments of colorectal cancer, specifically the uh, traditional chemotherapy, includes uh, lowering of the blood counts, uh, fatigue, nausea, diarrhea, and mouth sores. So those are the most common. And uh, providing that you follow instructions, um, what your nurse or your um, provider tells you to do, the uh, side effects can be well controlled. Um, there are some uh, rare, um, unusual side effects, um, which include um, hair loss from ironotecan. It's not a common side effect in our regimens for GI gastrointestinal oncology um, regimens, but it's possible. So keep that in mind. Um, Hair loss and thinning can happen with these regimens. Um, other um, side effects include hand foot syndrome, um, irritation of your uh, skin, of uh, the palms of your hands and feet, um, caused mostly by the 5-FU based regimens and capsidabine, which is an oral form of 5-FU. Some other um, side effects that are, can be common with on biologics. Um, are introduced, such as uh, drugs like uh, um, uh, bevacizumab, then you will have um, high blood pressure, um, protein in the urine, can have some rashes, and also rashes are more common with uh, drugs like um, um, cetuximab, uh, uh, pembrolizumab. Uh, so an acne, those drugs can cause an acne-like rash. So I'll pass it on now to Amber, who will talk a little bit more about some of the other um, possible side effects, but um, may not be as common as the ones that I just listed above. Amber? Yeah, thank you. So some of the other side effects that we see, I wouldn't, they are fairly common, just depends on what regimen you, you're on. So if you were to, um, be introduced to Fulfox, then with the oxaliplatin, you'll have the side effect of peripheral neuropathy. You may have the cold sensitivity uh, related to that drug for five to seven days after the treatment as well. Um, some of the less common side effects that we see um, with we don't really see the hair loss with the the Fulfox. Hair thinning is mainly common, like you said. It's very rare with the renatee uh, can to actually lose your hair, so we get that question asked a lot when you come in, when we get ready to start treatments, am I going to lose my hair? Uh, and with most of our treatments, the answer is no. So, so I have a question how about the uh, specific side effect management of that cold sensitivity. So I, we were discussing prior to the broadcast starting, you know, the weather in all the places that we live. And where I work, it's warm. And so when we have people who are on oxaliplatin, one of the things that we caution them about is when they get in their car, make sure the air conditioner vent is not pointed at your face because 10 minutes down the road when the air is really going and hitting their face and they get that sensation of not 
being able to breathe and they turn around and come back to the emergency room. But what kind of things do you tell your patients when it's really cold outside about how to uh, minimize that reaction? Yeah, so it's really um, hard to give oxaliplatin in the Northeast um, in the winter time. It's really rough. Um, I have, you know, some young patients that come in without socks, uh, with eye heels and their little tiny skinny jeans. And I say, oh my God, but they are prepared because they bring their boots and heavy um, socks. So in the winter time, we tell patients to wear a scarf around their face, a hat and gloves, uh, boots and socks. Um, and then uh, other times, and not when they go out, not to um, to just be careful, not to breathe in the cold air. And so they, muff, they muffle their, you know, cover their mouth completely. And obviously the, uh, the most common things that anyone can tell their patients are on oxaliplatin to decrease uh, the chance of um, the uncomfortable sensation of cold, um, um, cold induced seizures is to avoid the cold altogether. So avoid going into the, the refrigerator, put gloves on. Um, like you said, don't put in air conditioning right away in, in the um, warm weather or don't sit under air conditioning or a fan. But you so, said it, so can I? How do you how do you get around that? It's cold. Can I speak on this, Kelly? Uh, absolutely. So with the I I agree with um, you know I tell my patients make sure you bundle up make sure you wear a glove scarf glove you know hat before you go in the cold be prepared if you do go out make sure that you're aware that that's going to happen it's going to scare you it, it's okay we just need to kind of walk through it this is what it is expect it I can tell you I. I am a little bit doing a little bit different with this cold sensitivity in the fact that I um, am in the process of of working to get my a study going that completely contradicts everything that we just said, um, and that's with icing. Wow. Uh, I, yes, mm -hmm. we yeah. So I, I'm working on that now. I hope to have uh, the results of that within the year. Um, so it will completely contradict everything that we just said. And I really hope that it changes the way that we can treat our patients in the Northeast where that we can do this and it's not life altering for them. Very excited. I cannot wait. So is that designed? Can you, can you explain a little bit more about how, how, how are you managing the cold sensitivity with cold? Yeah, so a, a little bit. I'm actually, so we just got, or our IRB is in process as we speak, but um, I think it's actually approved, but you just, it's icing. So as opposed, you know, when you're, it's been studied that the cryotherapy helps prevent the mouth sores with the 5FU. Uh, mm -hmm. If you are in the colon cancer community, uh, then I'm sure you've heard of the Facebook group Colon Town. They are advocates of this completely, but uh, it is called icing. During the oxaliplatin infusion, you would ice your hands, your feet, your mouth, and you would ice the entire treatment. We believe mm -hmm. that that will de-escalate the cold sensitivity. Will that de-escalate the neuropathy as well? Um, we hope so. So there is a, actually a question. Um, there's a patient asking about neuropathy. Does it ever go away? I still have it three years later, fingers, feet, and legs. So in your practice, do you see a lot of the patients who receive doxaliplatin having long-term difficulties with um, neuropathy that is not um, that does not appear from cold exposure to cold? So uh, the, the the chronic neuropathy from oxaliplatin is um, it's dose dependent. So when you reach a certain dose, the majority of the patients, probably 99% of the patient will have the cumulative neuropathy. And then neuropathy is chronic and it's more like the diabetic induced neuropathy. And for the most part, so say a patient that get a limited amount, the patient that get it on the in the adjuvant setting where they only get uh, at six months, those patients um, with uh, uh, mo careful monitoring during 
the treatment and with appropriate dose reduction and to just start dose reducing and holding before they start to have functional impairment. We find that in those patients, the neuropathy mm -hmm. does go away. However, there are about 15 to 20 percent of cases where of patients where uh, it's uh, three years later and the neuropathy does not go away. For the most part, it does go away. It usually starts going away first in the hands and then in the feet. Um, but for those uh, patients that it's um, gone too far, they've, it, uh, the neuropathy will not go away. And there are no treatments for the neuropathy. They're just uh, some medicines can make them better. In my institution, we're actually studying yoga, patients that have a chronic induced uh, neuropathy from oxaliplatin. So those, some of the um, interventions can make the neuropathy better, um, but yeah. no uh, treatment. If prevention is the, is the key. Yeah, we usually will stop the oxaliplatin um, infusions after eight doses because we found yeah, that yeah. more than that. Yeah. Um, had yeah. a couple of patients who've had some success with acupuncture for that mm -hmm. long-term chronic neuropathy. I would say maybe 50%. So that might be something that um, patients could try as well. I've actually yeah, had a patient with yeah, cancer. Sorry, Amber? I've, I had a patient um, use henna, henna, the tattoos. Oh, and that helps? Yeah. Oh, interesting. Yeah. I wonder why that would work. Hmm. I, <laughs> that so, one I'm not sure. So we've talked about, you know, different treatments um, and how effective they are for neuropathy. What about um, the hand and foot skin changes that we see with some of our um, oral therapies, have you found that that is a significant problem for most of your patients, Nina? Yeah, it, c it can be well controlled. Again, um, um, if patients um, um, understand that they have to, first of all, be uh, candid and report their symptoms as soon as they start. As soon as the discomfort starts, they need to call us so that we can hold the drug. Um, and they can, and they need to start aggressive prophylaxis topical therapy. Um, so it's rare that we see grade three um, hand foot syndrome anymore. It used to be very common in the late 80s, early 90s, when uh, Zalota was being tested for, you know, first it was approved for breast cancer, and then later on, um, eventually it, it was studied for colon cancer and then approved. Um, in the early days, patients used to come in with a lot of pain and um, ulceration in their hands and feet, but not anymore. It's fresh in my mind because I just saw somebody this afternoon with grade three, which I was pretty impressive. Um, so if, uh, I would just recommend uh, prophylaxis and listen to your providers and your nurses. Report when you start to develop redness and tautness of the skin, you want to call um, your nurse and your providers right away and let them know so that they can make adjustment on doses, probably even hold the dose for a couple of days. Because what happens with hand foot syndrome, if it goes to grade three, then it's too late. It's going to take a long time for it to, um, to, to resolve. It'll take weeks. So. So Amber, um, when you have a patient who is starting to have difficulties with hand and foot skin changes or really any side effect, I think a lot of patients don't want to tell us when they're having difficulties because they think we're either going to change their treatment or stop their treatment. How do you make it clear to patients about reporting symptoms and that it may not necessarily cause an end to their treatment, but we, we can make adjustments to make it better. Right, so I, I try to make that clear from the front end when I educate the patients. I educate all of my patients on their chemotherapy regimens. So I just make that clear on the front end. I just need to know so that I can help you. If I don't know, I can't help you and we may get to a point where I'm not able to help you. I've also, I mean, I've been doing it for, for so long now. I, my, I walk in a room and my eyes go to hands or my, you know, I, you just, that's what you do. So I can kind of see them before they even tell me. 
and I'll ask a lot of times they'll, they'll say something and I'll be like, well, you know, that's not what it looks like. You're, you know, how is this? It made it difficult during COVID. Well, still with COVID, but in the beginning when everybody wanted to do virtual appointments to kind of identify those side effects, because you're not seeing the patient mm -hmm. in person, you saw their face. Mm -hmm. Of course, they're going to tell you everything's fine. It was, it made it a lot harder. Uh, it got to the point where I was having patients call me and say, well, I have this, you know, what do you think it could be? Send me a picture. Let me see what, what we can get. Let me look at it. Uh, that's getting a little bit better. And patients are more willing to come in the office now. But do you find that people think that they, they don't tell you because they think they're supposed to be having this? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I find yeah. that they, they'll tell me, but it was instead of the provider. So I get more out of them than, than my provider does. They'll willing to tell me almost anything. And then the, you know, Dr. Grothy comes in and they're like, nope, I'm fine. <laughs> it's true. They, and they, they, they tell more, um, they give more information to their nurses. That's, you know, that's why our oncology nurse navigators, they're always um, one of the strategies we have with oral chemo, especially oral chemotherapy to do lots of follow up with the, uh, by phone, uh, by the nurses, because they, we know, um, the patients will divulge more informa information to the nurses because um, nursing is the most trusted profession, right? It's our faces. We just look like people want to tell us stuff. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, but um, I think reassuring uh, patients that um, it, it's really important to tell us side effects because we can minimize the side effects and not have to resort to the point where we have to hold um, right. the chemotherapy. So it's best um, we would dose adjust and the dose adjustment are better than holding and they, can, and they can go, the dose adjustment can go a long way. You know, with oxaliplatin, it's best to dose adjust than, a, than to keep it a secret and then get to the point where they're miserable with pain and yeah. uh, inability to walk because the, it's gone so far. The other thing yeah. is I also believe that patients, because in our patients with, G, with colon cancer that most of their regimens are every two weeks, I truly believe um, that they forget. The, they, 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 they forget, so they really do, because I did a study where patients used to report their s symptoms electronically as they were experiencing them, and it w I would get an email, and it was a separate platform that my chart or gateway, this was a separate software. So I would have this, the system open, and it would beep when it, the side effect reached a certain um, uh, severity. So. It would, I had the advantage of reporting that, of having one of the nurses call or myself call the patient. The other advantage was that when the patient came in, they would, re did you have fatigue? And they would say, well, not really. Well, what do you mean not really? Look, I can show you your email. Your severity of fatigue reached skyrocket. And so oh. I truly believe people forget. It's just, uh, innate is human to forget to be able to uh, support another you know to tolerate another cycle of chemotherapy um, so you just put it out of your mind because the side effects get better the second week so i think that even though we say they don't t tell us because they're afraid that we're going to adjust the doses i i also think it's a little bit human nature not that that you we, we just forget so um, that's we, my, my interpretation. We've spent all this time talking about um, hand and foot skin changes, and there are some different ways to give um, some of the oral medication to try to alleviate some of that. Do you, in your practice, use any sort of dose escalation for the oral um, oncolytics to try to pr minimize some of the side effects that can occur? We do. Uh, in our, in my practice, we start with, we just, you know, just like it's dosing 81, you know, three, four, we do it that way, two, three, four. And we find that that actually has helped when you have some of the orals, those side effects, they come on fast. Uh, so 
we can kind of tell how they're going to be. If they get the full dose at first, it's going to hit them and they're, it's going to hit them hard. They're either not going to want to continue because they, we've made them feel so lousy or uh, their body just won't be able to, to tolerate it. So escalating it in that manner will keep them on the drug longer, therefore give them a better response. Nina, do you use a dose escalation strategy in your practice? Yeah, so the, the only drug that we dose escalate that it's based on scientific data is the redose um, trial up with regorafenib. So because that's a third line drug, uh, we find that, that a lot of a lot of symptoms related to their um, disease. Um, so to, you know, to put another, um, give them another um, drug, another chemotherapy, systemic chemotherapy is going to may make them more ill and we and, and and so that's usually was the case as you uh, both remember when regorafenib was uh, first approved now we have the data from the redose trial where we know that we can do a, a, a escalated escalation escalated approach and also, uh, that will lead to better tolerability and hence uh, 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 chance of a for a response so that's the uh, one drug that we use the dose those uh, escalation and then uh, patients in, uh, may go on second line um, um, oral um, say the um, cape ox or fulfic theory those patients they were previously treated with another frontline treatment uh, and based on the tolerability of the first treatment the second treatment the oral chemotherapy may be dosed um, accordingly so start at a lower dose and then escalate up but for the most part if people tolerate it uh, tolerate treatment well especially in the adjuvant setting whether it's um cape ox cape uh full fox we um go we try to do full dose just to up front and then sort of deal with the side effects so we we, yeah, we do that as well we and have our- we have gone I'm sorry, Kelly. Go ahead. So Go we ahead. have gone with our capes. If if they are not tolerating it at the dose, at the full dose, we will go down. You know, take yeah. a pill away. See how we can yeah. manage it the best way to keep them keep them on the regimen as long as we can. Yeah. Yes, it yeah. seems again, regorafenib is really the only drug that we do the dose escalation for. Um, yeah. In, we have found that patients tend to have more consistent dosing that way because they're not getting to have these severe hand and foot skin changes where they, you know, they have to stop the medicine until it gets better. If we slowly reduce the, you know, increase the dose over a period of weeks, they tend to have less and we can stop escalating when they get to the part where they're having trouble. For most mm-hmm. other things, we tend to dose reduce and we don't tend to go back up once we dose right. reduce um, because yeah. people don't tend to tolerate it. Correct. That's common practice. Yes. So um, when you are um, stop talking about giving the medications. So you have your infusion center, people come in and talk about, or, you know, people come into the infusion center to get their treatment. So Amber, you talked about, you know, using the ice, you know, prevent mouth sores. And now we have people who are using the, the cold packs to prevent their hair loss. What about um, when a person comes in, are there any, um, tips that you could offer or any advice that nurses could use as far as administering uh, administering their treatments. I'll give you an example. So at our facility, we give a lot of full boxery and we have found that if we give the platinum uh, first and then infuse the arenatecan second, sometimes people will start having this whole body um, reaction because the arenatecan is not body temperature. And so we will um, give the arenatecan first and oxaliplatin second. Have you found anything like that in, in your practice? 
We actually have one patient that we have to do that exact same thing with. Uh, it was it was very strange. And when it was first reported to us, the nurse reported it as an allergic reaction. So we had mm-hmm. to delve into it a little bit more to find out exactly what it was. Is that truly? Um, and it was it was just that. So we swapped it around and it it's fixed. But for the most part, our our chemo room is really good at you know kind of figuring out how each medication is given when we have tried to adjust the way some of the uh, pre-meds were given with the full Fox area. There was a time where they were giving all of the pre-meds up front, including the atropine and then giving the arenity can towards the end. And so we were having some issues and we kind of swapped it around a little bit. So do you give atropine as a rule in your patients when they're on arenity can? Yes. I usually let the nurses um, decide, the nurses and the patient, the, the infusion nurse and the patient decide. It's all up to them what they're going to do. So they, it's a trial and error situation. And each patient is individual how they deal with it. And then it's documented so everyone um, will do the same for that particular patient. So for some patients like to get it in half doses. Um, some all of it at once. Some want to wait altogether, actually. So I just leave it up to the infusion nurse and the patient what they want to do. Yeah, we we actually um, have it in our treatment plan as a scheduled medication, but we have had you know we have had more than a few patients who have developed constipation after mm-hmm. they get gotten the RNT can, and then we will make it as an as needed medicine if they start developing cramping or you know some hypersalivation all the things that happens that can mm-hmm. happen with that can then then they can receive it um but we're kind of the same we kind of assess what the patient actually needs um and and treat it accordingly yeah, we hold it as well if they are if they report constipation we've also lowered the dose we've cut mm-hmm. it in half now, what about um, antiemetics that you used prior to some of your regimens? Have you found one is more effective than another, Nina? Yeah, so for full Fox and full Fury, uh, we use uh, um, Aloxy and or Zofran. We have a tendency to prefer Aloxy um, and dexamethasone. Um, and then patients can do, um, they can do uh, Combazine on day one and Ativan, um, they can do that for day one, day two, and then day three, they can do as needed Zofran. Uh, with Fulfixiri, um, uh, for, uh, for, with Fulfixiri, we have a tendency to start off, uh, off, off, uh, start off with um, Emend, Aloxy, and or Zofran, mostly Aloxy, Dexamethasone, um, and as needed, Ativan. I have a tendency to give a lot of Ativan to my patients, especially uh, for six theory, because then they they just sleep through, and they're nice and peaceful. So those are the the two the two regimens. Um, with a uh, uh, fix theory, we do post chemotherapy dexamethasone. So the rule is that we. Uh, add and not take away. We would take away only if the patient wasn't tolerating a certain uh, compound or drug. And yourself, you have- Amber? What do you I'm guys sorry. use? We have the post treatment decks. When do you have them start it? Yeah, so we give a dose, um, uh, the pre chemotherapy IV, and then on day, the, the next a day we do um dex uh it's the real post dex um regimen is um eight milligrams bid to twice a day for two days and then goes four milligrams um to two uh, twice a day for two days and then stop i i do uh a quasi right i do sl- lower doses of dexamethasone just because I just um, am careful with the dexamethasone, just afraid of um, uh, myopathies and side effects. Um, so and it's just as effective. Prevents the crash. Yeah, exactly. And it's just as uh, effective to treat the nausea and the 
uh, uh, that way. I know it's a lower dose. Patients are not going to, I mean, it takes a lot of dexamethasone before people develop uh, side effects related to steroids. Um, in my experience, uh, I've found it takes really a lot, but um, a lot of my patients are young, getting younger and younger. Uh, mm -hmm. We call it rectal cancer, and I just want to give them uh, well control of the nausea with minimal side effects from the drugs. Mm -hmm. Amber, how about you? We we do the same with the exception of the post-treatment DEX. That was interesting. I mean, we do that with some of our taxanes, but not with our full foxes. Uh, we use a lot of Aloxy. We are using Amend. Um, recently, we've started using some Vanti. Honestly, uh, unfortunately, sometimes the antiemetics that we give prior are based on what the insurance will allow us to do. Um, so we kind of... and. Focus on yeah, that. We are, with our we, are fortunate, we, we are fortunate. The Amend IV is now formulary, so it gets if it gets administered, it gets reimbursed. Um, especially if you can prove that the patient needs it, um, has failed the Loxy and Dex. So if they fail a Dex, Dex pre med, then they automatically qualify for Amend. It's covered, and some um, uh, insurance is also do the truck tripack. I'm sorry. I, I still like the tripack better. Um, I'm, uh, I'm old fashioned. I haven't seen a tripack uh, in a while. Yeah. I, I And I have some, some patients that I use it. I swear it just works better. And then that, you know, that um, Sinvandi, the form of um, uh, Emend, a lot of patients just have that the, uh, the opposite reaction where they get nauseous. I, I just... I, I just love the tri pack for patients. So it's just that we can, it's dictated. We use the post treatment decks as well. And I have had a couple of patients who feel pretty good um, the day yeah. or two following their treatment. And so we'll have them started on their pump disconnect day. Um, and that yeah. works better for them. It, well, yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. So you, uh, you do how many days? Four days? So we usually do three, um, but we don't do the taper like you've discussed, but I will occasionally kind of create my own taper over three or two, over, you know, so extend it out to four or five days, depending on how much difficulty they had. Sometimes I may taper it down a little bit slower, um, mm -hmm. but so it kind of depends on if they complain of that, you know, I was feeling great until I stopped the dex and then I what do, you that find that that, do you find that schedule is better for the patient's quality of life? Not always, um, but sometimes, sometimes. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it also depends on the, the age of the patient. Like you said, sometimes the younger patients have a little bit better tolerance of just stopping the dexamethasone kind of like that, but the older patients may have a little bit of trouble. Plus the metastatic patients seem to have, you know, if they've been on treatment for a while, they also will tend to have a little bit more difficulty. Yeah. Um, one other drug to keep in mind is olanzapine, mm -hmm. Zyprexa. Um, yeah. If patients are, um, are resistant to all of the above that we discussed, Zyprexa, 2.5 to 5 milligrams at bedtime for five days after the chemotherapy works like a charm. Yeah, we do. You that. find yourself, sorry, do y'all find yourself starting with the 2.5 and then going up to the five, or do you start with the five? So, interestingly enough, it's not based on science, it's based on intuition. I, it depends mm -hmm. on the patient and how they tolerate the other drugs, and you know, because. Uh, uh, olanzapine is a, a psychotropic, an uh, uh, antipsychotic. I usually t tell them right up front that that's what it is, but and I'm not using it for antipsych is an antipsychotic. I'm using it for um, nausea. And then I, I look at their list, what other medications they're on, because there's always a drug to drug inter. There may be a drug to drug interaction with Composine or Reglan, um, and so then decide uh, what what I'm going to do. A two and a half or five. 
Yeah, yeah if you don't so, tell them about that medication, they'll they'll call you, want to know why you put them on a <laughs> antipsychotic. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I always say I don't think you are psychotic. I think you have nausea. It works really well. Yes, yes, it does. Yeah. That, Plus, they get, they get the benefit of appetite sp stimulation and sleep. So. Well, my, I always tell them, you know, start, I, I'll usually start with five milligrams and then I'll say to them, if you feel kind of hung over the next morning, then you can cut it in half. Yeah. That's mm -hmm. what I tell them. Yeah. Yeah. And it, with, also with the exception of my older it, generation. Yes. Yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. Older people that they 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 may be a little bit more sensitive, but just know that it can also be given. Although the you know the pharmacokinetic uh, of the drug is a one-time dose drug, we do find that small doses can be given if needed every six hours. So two and a half. If you want to do twice a day, you can do it the morning and the evening and. Um, patients that have lots and lots of nausea, they are resistant to all the other regimens, you can do two and a half every six hours. Obviously, do it slow and escalate the dosage like two and a half, twice a day, two and a half, three times a day, two and a half, four times a day. So, and it's you know, a really good anti-nausea medicine. You don't find people are too sleepy with that? I'm sorry? You don't find that your patients get too drowsy on that dosing four times a day? No, no. I mean, again, you have to monitor your patients, you know, like just say it's, you know, it's, it, you know, it's, we're going to try. Um, but in patients that are just resistant to every other regimen, um, that's one other regimen to think about. So what are the things that, um, you know, for people who have metastatic colorectal cancer, one of the things that I have found is a very difficult is appetite suppression, which contributes to fatigue. So how, what kind of advice or recommendations do you make to your patients who are having no appetite or, you know, nothing is appealing? So we yeah. spend, I spend a lot of time counseling my patients on, you know, what they should eat, what we can't eat, just talking to them, smaller meals, anything that they can eat, please try, whether they think it's just a small amount and it's not going to matter or not. We talk about flavorings, what we can do to flavor or waters, um, even foods that's not going to make them you know, increase their nausea or increase their uh, diarrhea. It, I find just talking to them. I have a nutritionist on my staff too, who is really great. And we, we talked to our, my patients together uh, about what they should eat, how many calories a day they should get, what's the best things for them to do. But I've found that just sitting down and telling them, look, you don't have to eat three meals a day. I know that that's what everybody tells you you should do, but you don't have to do that eat what you can throughout the day. If you just eat small bites all day long, then at least you're getting something as opposed to nothing. And hydrate, 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 hydrate. Mm -hmm. Nina, you have any um, good tips that you offer? Yeah, so um, I agree with all that Amber has said about you know small frequent meals, uh, foods that patients, people like um, uh, and to, um, always think about keeping your mouth moist because sometimes if your mouth is dry, you're more apt to not to want to eat and hydrate. Um, also, lots of sessions with the registered dietitian helps. Um, we're fortunate that we have a whole a team of them and they can be re-referred re back to them all the time. But part of my, um, when I see patients, that we always spend a little bit on nutrition because I think that's really important. You know, but when the anorexia and cachexia of advanced disease sets in, then it's really challenging um, because of the fatigue and pain and everything else. So some of the things that I have tried, where I had a little bit of 
luck is using uh, low doses of dexamethasone. Again, I'm I'm really careful with it. I'll do like four milligrams for two weeks, two milligrams for another two weeks, and then every other day and then stop. And that's really helped. Um, again, there's no, no science to it, but it helps a lot because it, it can help with um, fatigue, um, can help with pain, a visceral pain, um, it, it, bony pain as well, as well, and it, it, with the appetite. So that is my um, one of the times that I will freely use the dexamethasone with still with uh, with, uh, with caution. The other thing is to combine it with in younger patients with Marinol. And Marinol is a really old old drug that we used to use for nausea when I first started as an oncology nurse back in the 80s. We didn't have Zofran, so we had to uh, resort to Marinol. Um, so Marinol, it, I do believe it has been approved, FDA approved for appetite stimulant in the HIV population, um, AIDS population. So I, I'll give, I'll, I give it a try. I'm willing to try it, um, with, especially with younger, um, uh, with younger patients. So uh, for people in the audience, Marinol is, is the synthetic um, form of uh, marijuana or synthetic uh, THC. So that given at nighttime um, and dexamethasone during the day combined um, does, can help the appetite. So one of the things that I have found is that when people don't have an appetite, they just don't think about eating because there's yeah. not that thing that's stimulating them to eat. And so I'll tell people just to set a clock. You know, you've got your iPhone, make an alarm every three hours and you eat something. And we yeah. kind of do the same, eat whatever you want. We don't care if it is... Um, not viewed as necessarily something that's nutritionally um, healthy, but if you can get it in and it gives you some calories, then we're okay with it. I also tell them, find the five things that taste good and eat them all the time. <laughs> right? I do that. They all have yeah. the things that taste good. I do that, yeah. I also will you know, take things that other patients tell me uh, that has taste good to them or that hasn't. And I will just mention those when I'm educating another patient. You know, I have patients who have said this works or, you know, do this. I, I have patients, for some reason, pickle juice. Patients love pickle juice because they can taste it and it doesn't huh? taste weird. And so I'm like, eat pickles, eat as much pickles as you want. So I, I use, I listen to what my patients tell me and I take that on to, to help me in my my practice. My patients are my best yeah, resource. I pass, I pass that information. That's really good information. Um, what patients tell me, give to other. I tell them they, this is not some, there's no scientific data, but I take it's really yeah. worth it. But no I don't science. Know what the tells me. I feel like I have to pass it along. I do too. Well, yeah. and, and I will often explain to patients if you're not eating any, if you're not eating enough calories, you're not gonna, your fatigue is not gonna be improved. And so exactly, you have to yeah. yourself in order to give yourself energy. So what about you know, immediately okay. after chemotherapy, they um, are so tired. I think they can become, like you said, Kelly, they just uh, don't have anyone to wake them up and stimulate them to eat and drink so mm -hmm. it's um the same thing you know someone that's receiving you know a chemo active chemotherapy and becomes dehydrated because they're so tired that they don't even think about the drinking part and it's the same thing with the eating you know they're just so tired um that eating doesn't become a priority anymore right right and it's a, a bit of a vicious cycle if you don't eat you're tired and then you're too tired to eat or drink. Um, and so one of the things that I will often tell people is if you can increase your fluid intake, you may find that your fatigue is somewhat better. And if you can get up and move around a little bit, then your fatigue is better. But it's yeah. hard to get started. 
So we're going to move on to the questions and answer portion. And there is a question about side effects of Affinitor. So Nina, do you um, want to address side effects of Affinitor? What's the question again? The side effects of Affinitor. Yes, Everlimus? not something used to use for colorectal cancer, though. But there's a, oh, huh. Christy is saying ignore that question. Never mind. Yes. <laughs> I can answer it because I have, for my on Affinitor. <laughs> <laughs> I have a lot of patients on Affinitor. I'll answer it. <laughs> not for colorectal cancer. Not for colorectal. No. So here's, here's another question. Um, so what about fasting to help uh, prior to treatment to help improve the treatment? Anybody doing that at your center? Fasting? No, I, I don't recommend fasting. Nina, anyone, anyone at your center? We don't rec I don't recommend fasting. Um, the, the, the um, body that's when you're receiving chemotherapy the body is doing overtime and we can't we have to give it fuel that's the only way i can explain um you can you cannot fast i mean you can fast say because you're afraid you're gonna get nauseous so maybe ha have something really light fasting in that sense but not fasting you know to starve the tumor if that's what it, it's meant because of the um you know the sugar theory that uh, uh, tumors feed on sugar well i don't know um my prescription is to eat high calories um high protein uh, high fat meals um i love yeah. to give that prescription out every day so the problem with fasting in um, there's there's lots of evidence research about fasting um, and how it improves overall health. However, fasting has not really been studied in patients who have a malignancy and who are in chemotherapy. So we usually will tell people, you know, we do not recommend fasting either um, because we are the same. We want our patients to eat because most of them don't want to. So we have to encourage them to. Right. So there's another question about um, chemo brain. What do you tell your patients about chemo brain, Nina? Yeah. So cognitive fatigue is real. It's um, real. Um, and basically, um, you know, patients that receive adjuvant chemotherapy um, will it'll go away. Patient. Um, that are on chemo on, with metastatic disease that have to keep going. Um, it, it's something you have to deal with. Um, you know, it's the same thing as getting old and having a limited short-term memory. It's a real, you know, it, uh, you know, like I said, I call it cognitive fatigue. Um, mm -hmm. So Do you, you have to deal any, with it. Any recommendations on how to improve that? Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, uh, notes to yourself, frequent reminders, um, just your basic um, recommendation that you would make in someone that has a, a, a poor short-term memory. You know, the ability to concentrate and uh, think clear. I think, um, you know, make yourself concentrate, read books that are light, um, you know, watch something that's not heavy, um, go for a walk with fresh air. Those are some of the, again, not proven by science, but I don't think that science is proven. Chemo brain, you know, I believe in chemo brain and, and it, it's real because I see it every day. Um, so some, those are some of the interventions to clear your mind, clear your chemo brain. Okay. Amber, you have any tips you give people? The same thing, note taking. Smartphones are a great, great thing for chemo brain now because all you have to do is talk to your phone and it'll keep a note or set a reminder. Uh, don't be so hard on yourself too. It, you're, you may search for words and it may take you longer to find them, but that's okay. You know, just give yourself the time and, and find them. I remind my patients to just be easy on yourself. You're, you're going through a lot. It's expected. It's not anything that um, is not expected, so just give yourself 
give yourself time, gather, and it'll come to you. So I will um, encourage people to do uh, work puzzles. So things like um, word search or Sudoku or crossword puzzles, uh, especially if they had not ever done those kind of things before. And again, I'm with you, Nina. Nothing has ever been proven about chemo brain, but I see it all the time. And so usually if we can get people's brains to be engaged in a way that is different than they're used to, it tends to help kind of put the cogs back in the right track. Uh, it doesn't mm -hmm. cure it, but it makes it a little bit better. Mm -hmm. Do you at your um, practice use any kind of calendar or any kind of tools to help people keep track of their side effects? Nina, you had mentioned that you think people forget do you use anything now to help people think about what their side effects are? Yeah, we we encourage diaries. We have a, a binder that we give patients when they start, when they come in as new patients or they may start a new regimen. If their older patients been with us for a while, we started giving the binder about two, two, two years ago. And in the binder, there's a part where you can write notes. And so so that that's what our patients use because we offer that, but you can use anything like a notebook or even your smartphone on the notes and just write everything down. I think that's really helpful to write things down. So Amber, how about you? Any, any tools that you use? So we also have a new patient binder that has a section in it for side effects. Uh, I also, I am very available to my patients. I give out uh, my email address and I tell them, make sure you know give me a log keep a diary especially that first week because when they start they start their regimen I'm like okay I'm gonna call you in a week and I want to know how you feel so just write it down I, even if you think it's nothing write it down I just want to know uh, and I, that has actually opened up more communication than just that binder um, I actually I, I get reports now from a lot of my patients they're like well you said you wanted the report and so good so here's a yeah, patient Go patients ahead. are very good when you ask them to to write down. It's almost like giving them homework, and yes. they want to really please their nurse and providers. And they, I think it works even with blood pressures. I keep blood pressure diaries, mm -hmm. heart rates, um, SpO twos. Um, it's really helpful to see the pattern, of what's going on at home. I love it when people bring in a list to their appointments because that way you know yeah. all the questions are going to be answered and they won't get home and say, oh, I wish I had asked about that. Yeah, yeah. I love lists. Yeah. yeah, I do too. <laughs> Here's another question from the audience of another diet related question. Do you have anyone who has tried the keto diet to help minimize their side effects? I haven't um, I had have it to help minimize side effects. Oops, sorry. To help minimize side effects. We have had patients ask if, you know, for weight loss reasons, but not not to minimize any side effects. Nina, anyone trying that at your facility? Yeah, we, so well, first of all, we, um, we we discourage it, but I do have one patient. He doesn't have colorectal cancer. He has a different cancer, and he, he's he been on a keto diet since he started his treatment. He's on his 12th cycle, and he's lost a lot of weight. We discourage it. We completely discourage it. Do so, you feel like he's having fewer you know, it isn't, uh, it's hard to know because, you know, he, he's never been on a keto diet and been on chemotherapy at the same time. So um, he tolerated well, but he's young, yeah. healthy. He's got, you know, he's the type of person that you know would tolerate this particular regimen is well tolerated to begin with. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. So, you know when you compare him to other people who are having his the same chemotherapy, does he seem to be having less trouble? And could you um, say that the keto diet... The keto diet? Yeah. See, the, the regimen in general is well tolerated. Um, so it's hard to, hard to know if that keto diet is helping this particular individual because having 
if he wasn't on the keto diet, I bet you that he tolerated it just as well. He just lost a lot of weight that he doesn't need to lose, you know. Yeah. Um, so. Yeah, and that's the trouble with um, a lot of these kind of things. When people, I find that people find out they have cancer and then they change their complete, their, they change their diet completely. And then they start losing yeah. weight and they, you know, they feel terrible because they're not getting the things that they need. And, you know, they've started an entirely new diet while they're on chemotherapy, which is probably not the best time to start something new. Um, and so we have found that to be true. So um, we all work kind of in different places in the country. So, um, but it seems like we're all doing a lot of the uh, uh, similar things um, to help manage side effects from the patients. And, you know, as we've pointed out, nurses are um, an excellent resource for helping the cancer experience be, be, be better. So unfortunately, we're out of time. If you'd like to watch this webinar again, it will be available on the webinars on demand page, curetoday.com. Um, within uh, the coming days, I want to thank our panelists and audience for attending and participating in today's event. I would also like to thank Cure and our partner, Mayor, for making today's educational webcast possible. Don't forget to check your email tomorrow for the survey to be entered to win a gift card. Thanks for joining, and we'll see you next time. Goodbye.